Hello and welcome to the video version of Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with Joseph Tahovsky, co-author of 40 Thieves on Saipan, the elite Marine scout snipers in one of World War II's bloodiest battles, published June 2nd, 2020 by Regnery. Um, thank you for speaking with me. Well, thank you. So first, um, tell me, uh, so I know you're related to the, the person who the book is about, but can you tell me how you got into studying this subject and, and ending up writing on it? It all began at a eulogy that was delivered at my father's funeral. And through that, uh, what that gentleman had to say, it prompted me to open his footlocker that was in the garage. And it was always kind of something that you didn't touch because it was very personal to dad. And if you ever walked into a room and he was going through his footlocker, he'd close it right away. So after dad passed away, and this gentleman spoke at his funeral about this episode from Saipan that was related by this Marine sergeant that he came across um, that prompted me to open the Foot Locker and find all of his platoon rosters from Guadalcanal and Tarawa and Saipan, um, photographs of nameless men articles about uh, men who were his friends. At the time, I didn't know it. They just looked like other newspaper clippings. Mm -hmm. And uh, letters, thousands of letters from that my dad sent to my mother during World War II. And it was like opening up a time capsule yeah. and taking a trip back into history and seeing these people who were my parents through their eyes of being in their 20s and in love and one's overseas, one's back home. It was almost like from here to eternity, you know, mm -hmm. that they lived out. Mm -hmm. So, um, so at what point did you decide you wanted to write a book about what you found? Why well, first, there was one name on the roster that stuck out and it was William Knuppel. Mm -hmm. And there was this Marine buddy that my dad would always hang out with when he'd winter in Arizona, Bill Knuppel. So the first thing that I did was I traveled out to visit Bill to show him the roster, to show him the photographs that dad had and asked him if he was the man on the roster because it was a very, I wouldn't say it was an odd relationship, but when you just met him as a Marine buddy and you weren't thinking about Bill as his sergeant and my dad as his lieutenant, but at the time, whenever Bill would try to talk about Saipan or Don Evans or Martin Dyer, my dad would just say, Bill, those days are over and he would tacitly comply. And now I understand that even in their 80s and 90s, they still had this relationship of sergeant to lieutenant. Hmm. Amazing. And after I sat down with Bill and heard stories and all of a sudden some of the uh, nameless faces had names attached to them and not just names, but stories, it prompted me to go through his Saipan platoon roster and find out who else might still be alive. Mm -hmm. And besides Bill, there were four other gentlemen that were alive. One was quite ill and suffering from dementia and I didn't wanna bother him mm -hmm. because the more I found out from these other men and the effects of triggering memories, um, if, he, if he wasn't well enough to I didn't want to torture him in bringing up things that he'd rather forget because as Bob Smuts, one of the gentlemen who was alive that became a dear friend of mine, one of the first things he said to me was, you know, you spend your whole life trying to forget, but you relive it every day for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
that's um yeah that's pretty intense um and yeah I, I certainly appreciate sort of the your approach to all that um so tell me then about the story of the book itself what um you know what is it about it's about this platoon of marines that was very unique there are only two such platoons deployed in the pacific during world war ii uh, one was on Taroa, where they acted more like shock troops, like storm troopers. These 40 men landed to secure the pier um, on Taroa that was supposed to facilitate the landing for the rest of the troops. So imagine 40 men going in against 5,000 Japanese on Taroa. Mm -hmm. um, that was only a three day battle. The scout sniper platoon that my father's led was going to work behind enemy lines. It was going to be the first time in the Pacific where there might be civilian population they'd have to deal with. Uh, they were taught to live and work behind enemy lines for days and weeks at a time where firing a white rifle might be their last resort. Mm -hmm. So they learned, as Bill Knuppel told me, how to kill and cripple in ways that you can't even imagine hmm. silently. Right, right. So um, were you able to uh, get an idea of the training they did beforehand or does the book start on once the operation is, is about to happen? Well, as I um, grew to know these men as through their 80 year old eyes, I saw them as the 18, 19 year olds as they were. Mm -hmm. And getting to know them and the stories and what uh, a bunch of um, young kids who could give a damn is uh, what Marvin Strombo called themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't just want to start with a battle. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get people to know them. Um, so the first half of the book is their training on Hawaii, on Parker Ranch. And I could get a pretty good idea of what they were trained at through notebooks that they took in class on map readings. Um, there were some helpful articles in the Leatherneck Magazine that detailed uh, the Biddle method of bayonet fighting and you know, killing with um, strangulation gear and all of these silent ways. Mm -hmm. And then through the letters that my dad would write home, he couldn't tell uh, his wife what they were doing, but he might say, we were, we were at the beach for a week. Now, most people would think they'd be sunbathing, but mm -hmm. they were practicing rubber boat landings mm -hmm. or they were in the jungle. And then the men themselves would tell me missions that they would go out on mm -hmm. and training missions. Um, one of them was by Bob Smots, my Georgia friend, who told of the time when they were sent up into the Koala Mountains mm -hmm. to live off the land for a week. Mm -hmm. But instead they stumbled across this village of Polalu that they knew was off limits, it was posted as off limits to all military personnel because the whole town was filled with Japanese uh, loyalists and spies. Hmm. So much so that all of the men from the village had been sent to internment camps, leaving just women and children there. Hmm. And the woman who ran the general store was a spy who sent uh, signals to submarines offshore and also resupplied them at three little fingerlit canyons hmm. um, that were carved into Hawaii where the submarines would come and dock. And this is in 1944. Hmm. Um, sure. So this is all a story that this 80 year old guy told me. Um, and I saw on a map where there's this village of Polalu and there are these three fingerlit canyons that are cut into the right by Polalu so all of that corresponds. But then after we sent the book off to the publisher for printing, this gentleman named Richard Zuziak from Michigan contacts me 
because I was wishing his dad, John Zuziak, a happy birthday on Facebook, because I do that on our postings. When one of the guys from the platoon has a birthday, I wish them a happy birthday. So John Zuziak, his dad was in the platoon, mm -hmm. and Richard asked me if I'd like to see his father's war photographs. Mm. Wow. And I thought, sure, but it was illegal for any you know, Marine to carry a camera unless you were with the Correspondence Corps. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't want Marines snapping photos. It's tantamount to being a spy. Mm -hmm. Same way they couldn't keep diaries because they knew how much, how beneficial Japanese diaries were when they fell into their hands. They didn't want the converse happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought they were just going to be USMC issued photographs like a bombed out Garapan or, you know, a destroyed tank. But no, John Zuziak had a camera and he was on the miss mission into Polaloo mm -hmm. where they spent one week. The old woman spy there hooked them up with some girlfriend types. <laughs> and they were just having the time of their lives. Uh -huh. And and he was there. And there are all of these photographs with the guys clowning around with all of these young girls. Mm -hmm. And every photograph, it's only women or children. So it had to be Polalu. The collection of men in the photographs never knew each other before. Saipan, and one of them was killed on Saipan. So this is about the only time and place that it could have happened was on Polalu. Yeah. And there's a picture of the four of them around the little old head woman, the spy. Mm. And do you know what they called her? What? Mom. Uh. <laughs> uh... And all of this is written, you know, with everybody's name underneath, you know, and I, we immediately had to go back and do some rewrites in the book uh, because when one of the fellows on the trip referred to the girlfriends as geishas, mm -hmm. I used the word more in the traditional term of geisha, but I think people in their minds have a more salacious version of the word geisha. Like it's almost tantamount to being, you know, a call girl, which mm -hmm. isn't the case. They're just very um, properly trained hostesses. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we had to go back in and change it because the little 16 and 17 year old girls, they have a photo of them all sitting together in front of a palm tree. That prompted a rewrite. Yeah. Um, there was also a, a kid who joined the platoon late and he was 17 and his birthday was on June 15th, his 18th birthday. That's mm -hmm. the day they landed on Saipan. Okay. And through what the guys, how they'd talk about this Hobart was his nickname, was that he was just this like scrawny nuisance of a kid. Hmm. But John Zuziak had a picture of Hobart and you've never seen a bigger, more corn fed baby <laughs> Huey Lummox in your life. And just beaming from ear to ear because he's a Marine with these other Marines. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's cool stuff. Um, I'm speaking with Joseph Tahovsky, author of 40 Thieves on Saipan. You can find more information about the book at 40thievessaipan.com. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, Please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. That actually, so, yeah, when you describe this, the training these guys went through, you know, it makes me think sort of to degree, you know, modern day SEALs or SEALs, you know, from Vietnam War on, you know, like special operations, basically. 
the, these were sort of, well, they were certainly precursors to Green Beret and Navy SEALs, but they were basically trained to live and work behind enemy lines and gather intelligence. Um, they had to take, to take courses in map reading, how to read maps, draw maps mm -hmm. uh, from memory to make maps while they're in the field. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to use some information from Marvin Strombo's notebook, like class notebook, mm -hmm. to uh, build a scene of how Vince Slavin, who was another sergeant besides Knuppel, um, taught the class in map reading and uh, aerial intelligence. Did they learn any Japanese? They didn't. They had one gentleman from the platoon who was named Floyd Wyatt, mm -hmm. who could speak Japanese. Otherwise, the four, they never needed to know Japanese prior to Saipan, because every battle they went into, they were going up against seasoned Imperial troops mm -hmm. who fought to the death. So there was no need to know any Japanese, mm -hmm. um, but they had a little card, almost an index card in size of Japanese phrases like um, drop your weapons and then how to say it phonetically, mm -hmm. um, uh, shimpi shinai day um, is, means I think um, don't be afraid you know, things that they would say to, to the Chamorros hiding in caves. Oh. So for that, they had all of these sentences that they could could say to put the civilian population at ease. Mm -hmm. I noticed in the book blurb, I think I read that uh, some, some comment about uh, they liked guys who ha had a brush with military law, like who kind of <laughs> were willing to cross the line. Right. My... Uh, I learned that from Bill Knuppel because he was with my dad. Uh, he's the first guy chosen for the or <laughs> it was an all volunteer platoon, mm -hmm. but he was the first uh, fellow my father asked to volunteer, mm -hmm. and he was right by his side during all of the recruitment process. And the first thing that they did was go through their record books, mm -hmm. and Bill was a little perplexed at first until and he said why why are we doing this why don't we just talk to all of the guys and my dad told him that they were going through the record books because he wanted to see if anybody had served brig time mm -hmm. for being in brawls or drunkenness and uh you know being a uh, rowdy mm -hmm. uh, because the loser goes to the infirmary and the winner goes to the brig yeah so the guy in the brig is the kind of guy I want because he's been in a tough situation and he knows how to handle himself. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so what about the um, the gear they use? Do you have much information on what they actually took with them? Well, they had, um, when the Marines first landed on Guadalcanal, the rifles that they were issued were these 1903 Springfields left over from uh, World War I. Mm -hmm. with a six uh, bullet clip and bolt action. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time Tarawa came around in Saipan, they'd moved on to the M1s. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that was very useful is that they were all familiar with the Springfields and they were a very accurate rifle. Mm -hmm. um, and they were uh, accurized with the addition of a unital scope, with, which was the technology of the day. And the scope extended almost the length of the barrel. Mm -hmm. And that made, I forget the actual amounts uh, of distance, but it uh, made the rifle accurate to within an inch in a distance of a mile. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the things that I learned from my fellows was that, because you don't think about it, you see this on TV and a bullet fires out of a rifle and it goes, bam, straight to the target. Mm -hmm but a bullet travels like a football pass mm -hmm. because it drops in gravity for every foot that it travels and how you have to adjust for wind, even something as subtle as your heartbeat could throw off your target. Mm -hmm. So to hit a distance at a great, uh, hit a target at a great distance, 
might be a little bit more fortuitous than one would think the farther the distance grows. Mm -hmm. But they had these spring fields that, there were, that were accurized and there were 12 of them that were equipped with unertal scopes for the whole regiment and six of them were given to this one platoon. Oh. So besides the unertal scoped spring fields, they also found shotguns very effective. They were against the rules of law uh, for warfare, right. but there weren't really any rules in the Pacific, uh, primarily because the Japanese never signed the, what is it? I think it was first called the Geneva Protocol. Hmm. So all of the things that you would expect in fair treatment in, in, the, um, in Europe wasn't effective in at least for American POW American POWs in the Pacific, mm -hmm. um, but they, so they found shotguns very effective because of the dense jungle and the not being able to spot a target necessarily within you know uh, a foot diameter. It might be broader than that. So they they thought uh, that was very effective, and then for um, the silent killing, they had an array of knives that they could use, mm -hmm. um, a raider stiletto, which was designed exclusively for the marine raiders mm -hmm. who made their fame on uh, Guadalcanal and in the Solomon Islands. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I believe that the scout sniper platoons were sort of born after the raider battalions were, um, how do I say? Um, not necessary anymore. Hmm. The raider battalions became filtered out through the rest of the Marines because their, the need for a battalion sized troop um, sort of diminished as they went into islands more like Saipan mm -hmm. and more like uh, Okinawa or Iwo Jima that might be larger. And that a smaller platoon trained like raiders would be a more effective sort of point unit, you know, mm -hmm. to be working behind the enemy lines. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also carried strangulation gear, mm -hmm. which uh, one of the fellows in the platoon, Wild Bill Emmerich, um, he was a club fighter out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he called it a mafia necktie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what, uh... Apart from just wrecking havoc, what, what was their actual mission, you know, when they were sent out? What, what was their goal? They were out to scout enemy locations hmm. and bring back information of enemy strengths um, so that they could uh, um, direct naval hmm. and uh, uh, ground artillery onto those locations to facilitate the movement of the front lines. Hmm. Uh, and that's where the map making had to be so uh, diligent and accurate because if you make a mistake on a map, it could cost you know, thousands of lives of your comrades or maybe even your own. Hmm. So the map reading and map uh, making was, was very important. And I found some samples of uh, maps that uh, could have been drawn by the scout snipers um, that were in Colonel Risley's daily journal that I found at the um, in Bethesda at the National Archives. Mm -hmm. And that was also quite a useful piece of equipment because these gentlemen would mention things and events and Colonel Risley would provide the date and even the time uh, because they were prominently mentioned in, in his daily journal because they reported directly to Colonel Risley, who was the commander of the 6th Regiment. Uh, and while they weren't in the field, they'd also function as the security guards for the regimental command post. So how uh, how long were they expected to be behind enemy lines before they returned? That would all depend upon 
the length of the mission, if they got delayed along the way, from what I can understand, I think about um, about five days was the most from what I could piece together from the gentlemen's stories mm -hmm. that they were out. Normally it would just be a day or two, mm -hmm. um, but they were equipped, to, they were all trained on water discipline on how you make a canteen last for as long as possible, mm. um, you know, to, to forage for their food instead of carrying sea rations, mm -hmm. because quite often they would go out without a pack on and with as little gear as possible. Mm -hmm. And also in gear not suited for normal combat because it would make too much noise traveling stealthily through the jungle. They all wore a soft sort of sniper cap mm -hmm. and they wore tennis shoes instead of you know big clumsy boondockers. But they wore their uniforms overall. They didn't wear civilian clothing or, or hide. No, them. no, no. Right. A lot of them didn't wear shirts, even though they were told to wear shirts. Huh. Um, but you know, a lot of that could just be by the time you know they were five days into battle. It's not as though they got a; <laughs> they barely had food and water, let alone a clean, you know, pair of clothing. Yeah. Or even you know socks. They said you you only ever changed your socks when you were back at the command post. Hmm. So how? Because otherwise, you didn't know when you were going to be taken off guard. So how large, uh, so you say a platoon, so what was the total number of, uh, of men in this unit? 40. 40, and would they split up? Would they do these missions in, in smaller groups or all 40 at a time? There were four 10-man squads, and within those squads, there'd be teams. So mm -hmm. sometimes a whole squad would go out, sometimes teams would go out, one or two teams. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's a, a lot of tension for the, um, was your dad in charge then? Was he, he was in charge of the platoon this year? Correct. He, he was the lieutenant in charge. So how much tension, did he get a sense of how tense he was when an element would go out? What, or would he go out with each element or were, would he send them out and maybe just have to worry about them returning? He, he would direct the men there were a few times when they went out all together as a platoon. Mm -hmm. um, and then he would, he would lead the group, mm -hmm. but otherwise he'd be, he'd be like the conductor of a symphony orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, deciding on which man he sent out. Um, and it was one of those things that were in a, in a document that he saved an officer training about, um, sending men to their death like death is inevitable mm -hmm. you know it's a part of war um up until saipan i don't believe he'd lost any members of his platoon because i've had all of the rosters and i've searched names it might be that two men died on tarawa um, but he had five men die on saipan and i think it really affected him in fact in the letters that he would write home you can see sort of the descent of his personality from being his first combat on Guadalcanal and then to Tarawa and then after Saipan. His letters that he wrote home became a little bit darker hmm. uh, and a little bit more, not argumentative, but lacked a little bit of his signature patience that hmm. he was known for hmm. uh, um, among his men. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, Roscoe Mullins, one of the fellows in West Virginia, who's the only surviving member of the platoon right now, said that uh, yeah, your old man put up uh, with a lot of, you know, with a lot from us. Um, and made, we made him lose a lot of hair, but we would have moved heaven and earth for that man. Mm -hmm. And so you said he was in his 20s, but exactly how old was he at this time? He was 28. 28. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I'll turn, I, I don't want to go into too many more details of the book because, you know, I encourage people to read it and, and find out more details uh, themselves. Um, but let's turn, you mentioned some of the resources you've used or a lot of them that you used for this research. Um, what, what else did you use that you haven't mentioned yet? 
Well, Bill Knuppel, besides the stories that he told, and as an 80-year-old man, these they only can remember what they can remember, yeah. you know. But he had uh, written a little story called Arello and Dooley. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very helpful in that Arello and Do Dooley were two privates in the army stationed at Schofield Barracks who went to high school with one of the squad leaders of the 40 Thieves, Don Evans. Hmm. So when Don Evans convinces his two high school buddies to go AWOL from the army and join the 40 Thieves for the invasion of Saipan, hmm. Bill Knuppel wrote that whole episode down from what happened when they were getting drunk in the slap shoot at Schofield Barracks. Um, and how, you know, when they started drinking, when they ended drinking, when they had to get back on board ship, down to uh, Evan stealing the rifles for his buddies so they'd be armed when they hit the beach on Saipan. Mm -hmm. um, I met, and also through Bill Knuppel, I was able to find the nephews of Don Evans, who was on Saipan and a squad leader, and they were very helpful in providing photographs and letters that Don wrote home. Mm -hmm. um, besides that, Peter Senich wrote a book about uh, Marine scout snipers in Korea in World War II, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. And it had photographs of uh, father's platoon members in it. In fact, one of Knuppel and Evans sitting together with their unital scope rifles, hmm. but he didn't know their names. Oh. Um, one of the fellows from the platoon was quoted in the book, Otto Hebel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, besides that, um, Battle Cry, actually, from by Leon Uris, his first novel. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the 6th Marine Regiment. He was in H Company under Colonel Raymond Murray. And Bill Knuppel knew him because Bill Knuppel was in H Company before he became a scout sniper. Mm -hmm. um, and Battle Cry is Uris's fictionalized version of his role in the 6th Marine Regiment during World War II. Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, whereas Colonel Murray is known as High Pockets and Howlin' Mad Smith has a different name and everybody's name has changed. But in the book, he writes about this notorious group of thieves <laughs> and all of these bold escapades that they did. And one of them entailed stealing an army colonel's Jeep. Uh. And, and at first I was reading it and I thought, well, this can't be, this can't be dad's platoon because it's in, they, in, in the book, it's a company. But could you imagine stealing 120 cots for an entire company and it not being noticed? So maybe they stole cots, but probably not 120. Mm -hmm. But I went around to each one of my little old guys and I said, did you, did you ever steal an army colonel's Jeep? And to a man, it was just kind of no. And finally, I broke one of my little old guys down. It was uh, Marvin Strombo in Montana. And it was almost as though you didn't want to rat out a buddy, you know, even though they're 80, 90 years old, nothing's <laughs> going to come of it. You know, well, who did you guys ever steal a Jeep? And he said, an army, army colonel's Jeep. And he said, no, it was an army captain's Jeep. Yeah. And we beat the hell out of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, still, <laughs> yeah, that's and, funny. And, and then. And then I meet uh, Al Yunker was another fellow in the platoon. I met his son, Al Yunker Jr. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mentioned that Jeep and Al Yunker Jr. said, yeah, dad always mentioned using that for the booze runs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, they did more than just steal it. They, uh, they, <laughs> they well, utilized it. <laughs> yeah, well, was booze, were they allowed to drink this booze they were getting? Well, they were actually stealing it from Navy and Army stockyards. You know, they would they would break in. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them tells uh, Roscoe Mullins because they all have wire clippers because that's part of what they would do behind enemy lines. They would back then to communicate. You had to run wire for yeah. field telephones to work, and you know sometimes they would clip the wires. 
but somebody told them don't clip them because then they can find the cut and repair it. What, you, what they used the clippers for was they'd take a straight pin and drive it through the cording, which would short out the line and then they'd clip the ends of it mm -hmm. so that you couldn't see where, where the short is coming in the whole wire. Uh, they knew their business. I guess. <laughs> they, they, well, you know, these these gentlemen grew up in the, the depression where they had to learn to do without mm -hmm. and they learned how to utilize anything and everything as uh, as best as it could. Mm -hmm. You know, so they, you know, even the Boy Scout knives that they would carry with them would be a weapon from time to time. Mm -hmm. You know, broken glass. Um, uh, Knuppel tells a story that was verified by other guys in the platoon. The, I think the second night on Saipan, there was a tank bonsai and they had no weapons to fight it with. So they made their own Molotov cocktails mm -hmm. and they'd smash it on the turret and the gas would run inside and ignite the munitions and everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's what this Marine Corps SWAT team had for weapons, mm -hmm. is Molotov cocktails. I'm speaking with Joseph Tahovsky, author of 40 Thieves on Saipan. You can find more information about the book at 40thievessaipan.com. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. So did you record, when you interviewed these guys, did you record audio recording or did you, were you writing it down? You know, I, at first I had a camera, mm -hmm. but I found that they didn't, weren't as free to talk in front of a camera mm -hmm. as they were when I just had a microphone. Okay. But then a lot of them, especially Roscoe Mullins in West Virginia, his voice is very gravelly and he has that little bit of a West Virginia twang. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like listening to someone who's speaking French when your only experience with French was maybe as a junior in high school. Uh, uh. So I'm understanding what he's saying by sort of repeating keywords. And I can tell by his body language as well. So I would take notes as well. So um, mostly audio recordings. And then later on, I would take notes because, as I said before, they can remember what they can remember mm -hmm. as far as big sequences are concerned. Right. But they might have a sentence, a line that would be just so perfect that, that no one could write it. But, but they lived it. I remember Roscoe Mullins said, you train and you train and you think you know everything. But once that ramp goes down, mm -hmm. you don't know shit. Yeah. School, school's just begun. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, who, who, who could make that up unless you were there and you lived it and you knew? Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of them, and that helped build the, the, their... I don't want to say characters because they're real people, but build their persona in the book mm -hmm. was using as many of their phrasing and cadence as I could get out of their um, audio recordings. How, how about the ones, the individuals who are reluctant to talk about it? Like, how did you, because I'm sure some of them had, hadn't even talked to their families about some of this stuff, maybe. no. No, these guys never talked to anybody about any of it. Um, oh, God, who did I just meet? Um, Bernie Jones, his daughter just contacted me because she saw his, her dad's name on the front cover of the book. Mm. 
And all we ever knew was that he was a Marine. If they talked about anything, it was New Zealand, you know, mm -hmm. happy times. Maybe they might mention a buddy. But as Bob Smott said, you know, if you've never been in combat, you don't know. It's uh, there's no point in talking to anybody. And Roscoe verified this saying, you know, everyone bothered me to tell them to tell them what it was like, what we had to live, what we went through, what we did. Mm -hmm. So I told them. And you know what? They didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. Because these fellows that shipped out for war in the Pacific left in 1942 and didn't come home until 1945 and saw no one but other Marines, basically, mm. yeah. you know, besides some time on New Zealand or, you know, on Hawaii for whatever brief Liberty time you had, mm. um, you were just living um, with the Marines. You were getting sort of, as, as Marvin Strombo said, you got treated worse than dogs. Mm. And he said, and I think that was to make us mean. And it worked, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, dad tells a story about um, I think it was on Hawaii or it might have been on Saipan, where a private writes home to his family that um, the food here is so awful that I don't think I could survive without the sardine, the canned sardines I can buy at the PX. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we get we're fed slop. And the, so the lieutenant who was um, um, censoring the letter said, uh, I'm a lieutenant and we eat the same slop too. And that letter that got, went back home got into the hands of some senators, uh, and we ca which caused an outrage in the United States where they sent over congressmen to tour the facilities to make sure that these servicemen were being fed properly. Hmm. And dad's story was one day, these four big semi trucks full of food came in, steaks, you know, vegetables, produce, dairy products. Right behind the four semis came all of the congressmen who took photographs and were shown everything. And the minute the congressmen left, the semi trucks drove off yeah. to the next camp that they were visiting. So oh, wow. <laughs> that's, they, they, uh, you know, they, they had a, a rough go of it, not just, you know, with the enemy, but just uh, living amongst themselves. And when you're in that type of camaraderie for that length of time in such formative years, there is no way that you can go back home and tell anybody about it because they're just going to think that you're an animal, mm -hmm. you know, basically. Yeah. If they were, went back home to tell people how many Japanese they killed and how they killed them. My God, wouldn't people look at you like you were just uh, some type of Hannibal Lecter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that that makes sense. That uh, yeah, that's an interesting um, take on what holding back. You know, like often you hear like the memories are too tough for them, but then what you just said, you know, like other people would just not be able to handle it. You yeah. know. Well, and and two in the memories these all of these fellows were haunted by nightmares their entire life. Um, when I went to visit Bob Smots in Georgia the second time, his wife, Alma Jean, and they were sweethearts before he went into war. They met at an Alice Chalmers tractor show in Oklahoma. And um, they got married after the war and she took me aside and said, it's so good that Bob has someone to talk to. Um, and then she went on to confide in me that as a young bride, she would wake up at night to find Bob choking her mm. because ha he was having his nightmare mm. of being in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Japanese. Mm. And he, she would wake up and he'd be choking her. And, and she said, finally, you know, eventually I, I, I figured out the warning signs of when his nightmare would be coming on mm. and I'd be able to wake him before he'd get to the nightmare. Mm -hmm. But you know, Roscoe Mullins told me his nightmare. Um, Marvin Strombo told me his. I learned all about the nightmares after Bill Knuppel passed away. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned them to Al Yunker Jr. once. I said, did your dad ever have nightmares? And he looked at me and said, there wasn't a night in my life that didn't go by 
that I would wake up in the dark, listening to the sound of my father tearing the bedroom apart mm. in his never ending, never ending fight against the Japanese. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, and everybody knew not to wake grandpa if he was sleeping, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, well, from that, actually, my next question is sort of a different. Uh, so what was shifting the, gears? <laughs> yeah, it's shifting gears. Yeah. From that, from that um, intense discussion to uh, what part of the research did you find most enjoyable? just meeting all of these old men. And if you were to see them walking down the street with a walker or a cane, you would just think that they were just little old guys. Mm -hmm. And here they have these stories and experiences that are just phenomenal, that it became almost um, a duty on my part to get this book written. One of the last times that I met Bill Knuppel was God, maybe February of 19, pardon me, eight, uh, what would it have been? 2013 mm -hmm. or 2014. And he died a month later. And he gave me everything that he had. All of the photos that he had, a uh, little book that he'd written called Semper Fi, his diary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he just handed it to me and he said, this would make a damn good story. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's when, okay, I, I, I get it now. And my, and my parents saving all of the letters and all of the documentation and the platoon roster. I couldn't imagine having, uh, this wouldn't have happened if my dad hadn't saved everything. Mm -hmm. you know, um, the, uh, a little um, mimeograph document, know your enemy. Liberty rules while they were on New Zealand. You know, don't say the word bloody. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not what you think it means. <laughs> and all of these other things of the, the do's and don'ts um, of, of when they were stationed in New Zealand, his officer training. You know, um, mm -hmm. and my dad would always say, is it um, that famous Sun Tzu quote about if you know your enemy? Hmm. He'd always be saying that to me. And I think that's just something that they ingrained into him hmm. in officer train, officer candidate training. And there it was in one of the documents, hmm. you know, know your enemy. Yeah. What, what part of New Zealand did they, um, did they stay in? These guys were around Wellington at hmm. uh, camp, I think it was called Camp Russell, but they always just referred to it as Pie Kakariki hmm. is where they stayed. So what, uh, what did you come across that most surprised you? Probably the nature of this platoon. And the more I read about it, the more I learned about it, the more it clarified um, peculiarities of my father. Mm -hmm. You know, one, he never slept at night. Mm. Frequently, if I'd get up and go to the bathroom, he'd be in the living room reading a book or asleep in a chair. And I wouldn't even be making noise and he would startle. Hmm. And, uh, and one time I asked him, dad, how come you just don't, you know, how come you can't sleep at night? And he said, I don't know. I think it's something left over from, from service because you never slept at night because that's when the Japanese were most active. Hmm. Hmm. And, you know, still throughout the day, he would, catch little naps where he could. And that's how he would, you know, get enough rest. Wow. Um, and, and he could, you know, fall asleep in a second and then wake up just as quickly too. Um, and also he never like took me to fireworks, hated fireworks, hmm. you know, never, never did that. But uh, I, would, I would imagine it would be the nature of the platoon and how unique they were in the scheme of things. Uh, and I found the Peter Senich book maybe shortly after Bill Knuppel died, maybe two months after research. Hmm. And I think I began starting to put all, it was like a big box of a jigsaw puzzle hmm. that I had to put together because all of these stories might have, you know, been an incident of their own. Mm -hmm. Or they were, you know, um, 
A good example might be the push into the valley when one of the squads almost gets wiped out walking into an ambush. Mm. Um, Bill Knuppel tells the beginning of the story. Uh, Bob Smots tells the middle of the story. Marvin Strombo has a scene in the middle of when he's helping one of the guys who's dying mm. from having his body riddled with bullets. And uh, Mullins tells the end. Mm. And, 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 and at first time, they seemed like just four disparate stories. But then as I had them all you know, pushed around on a table, I saw, well, this is how it fits together. Mm-hmm. And, and there were so many stories like that when Martin Dyer was sent off that, you know, the, his fateful night. Um, it was Mullins who stole the, uh, Strombo who told the beginning of the story, who was Dyer's buddy. And it was Mullins who told the rest of it and a little bit from Hobart mm-hmm. um, because they were with Dyer that night. Um, so it was putting all of these pieces together and uh, finally, it was this big, cumbersome oral history of something like 600 pages. Mm-hmm. And all of my early mentors were professorial types that, you know, lived on minutia. Mm-hmm. And everything had to be explained. You're like, what is a Louis? Mm-hmm. You can't just say first Louis. You have to say a Louis is a lieutenant, mm-hmm. uh, slang for lieutenant. Um, and it was really boring and really dry. It was yeah. interesting, you know, when, when you'd get to some good parts, but you had to wade through so much of it to get to the good parts mm-hmm. that um, someone, a, a publisher opined, write it as a narrative. Mm-hmm. And it took a while to figure it out. And the acquisition of my co-author, Cynthia Crock, who mm-hmm. was an author and a friend that I'd known of for some time. And I really kicked myself for not getting her involved earlier so that more of the gentlemen would have been alive to appreciate the the fruit of their labor really the 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 sweat of their brow because this is their story you know i was only fortunate enough to be the conduit to tell the you know their truly remarkable story of these you know honorable and noble men what happens to all the details that didn't make it into the book you know they're in the unedited copy that's on my computer. Uh, so I have this uh, little supplement that might be the untold stories of the 40 Thieves, because to keep it readable, mm-hmm. to keep it succinct, to because it's like anything else. If you don't hook people right away, if you don't get them interested right away, they're not going to wait to find out whether they like the book when it comes to page 150 or not. You have to get them interested right away. So there was a lot of um, editing that needed to be done. One of the first, you know, criticisms that I got was there are too many characters. It's like, well, there are 40 men. It's a platoon. But so I'm trying, like everyone who's not hearing things properly, oh, you're full of it. There are 40 men. Well, no, that's true. You know, they, they, you, you can't be distracted. People couldn't read Tolstoy, where there are hundreds of characters. Not only are there hundreds of characters, they all have two or three different names that they go by. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we got it down to a character flow chart for the key players that are dealt with more often, and then there are a few cameo appearances of characters that are woven in for necessity at certain times and then they drop out but the thread is always Knuppel and Evans and Dyer and Ski and Strombo and Smots and Mullins. Mm -hmm. Was there a um, particular question that you'd really maybe you still don't have an answer for that you, you really wish you could find out or maybe something just took a lot of effort and finally you hit you know pay dirt and answered it? You know, I don't think it's so much that there was a question that was not answered because they can only remember what they can remember. Mm -hmm. I I really regret that somehow I hadn't begun this before my father had passed away 
because even though he died at 96, he was still sharp as a tack and could remember everything with great clarity. Um, my brother had this wonderful habit of putting my parents in front of old photo albums and recording their memories as they scroll through the photographs and talk about people in them. So that's where I got a lot of information about dad's lieutenant buddies mm -hmm. uh, from mom commenting on them because she met them all when they were in OC school together. Mm -hmm. And dad would speak of little episodes, nothing that had to do with battle, but interesting things that might have gone on or things that he found remarkable, mm -hmm. like coming across this army fellow in a trailer cooking pancakes in the middle of Saipan. And it's like, how, how does this guy get pancakes in the middle of Saipan? And we're getting, you know, sea rations, basically leftovers from World War One still. Yeah. Um, so there are little episodes like that. But I really, you know, would have loved to have asked my dad about Don Evans and Martin Dyer and what it might have been, not, not like to send them off knowing that they might get killed, but just to get his, another viewpoint on these fellows. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there's a question that, the, the hardest one was getting them to fess up on who, who stole the Jeep. Yeah, yeah. And, I got, and I got that out of them. So I was pleased because that, yeah. that verified that, you know, the story in, in Yuris's book had a, a scrap of truth to it. Yeah. So then I started to look at it a little bit more as, oh, these guys could have done that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was keeping faithful to their words and their memories, but still to turn it into a story, we had to put flesh on the bones and help paint the picture as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Um... I don't know if the army, I think, I don't know if the army back in World War II, you know, you personally signed for equipment and you're financially on the hook for, for what you signed for in the army, as far as I know. So yeah, I feel, I feel for that army captain who uh, maybe had to owe for a Jeep. Um, I, I guess. Well, not... <laughs> they, he got it back in the end. Uh, it just didn't, it, it happened. Uh, it happened right before the thieves shipped off. And it was one of those episodes that we had to just prune out. You know, the Jeep had been forgotten. We didn't want to bring it up in chapter 14 when it was over with in chapter eight. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 he did get it back, oh. but that's how they know that they beat the hell out of the thing. Oh, right, right. That's true. They'd also painted it in marine colors, so. Uh, I don't know if they painted it back to army colors to give it back, but, uh, or put the insignias on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously you've talked about a lot of uh, things in the book and your research that were very emotional. Was there anything else you maybe haven't mentioned that had a very strong emotional impact on you? And that could be even positive, not just negative, something positive maybe. One of the fellows that very little was known about was a guy from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. whose name was Philip Johnson, who was only known as an odd duck. He was an odd duck. But he's, one of the things that we wanted to do is create everything. We know everything about Don Evans. We knew everything about Martin Dyer. We knew everything about Daniel Kenny knew everything about Tommy Arello. These are all fellows who, who died on Saipan. But besides knowing that Philip Johnson was an odd duck, nothing else was known. So we had to sort of create a personality for him. I said, well, what would make him an odd duck? Hmm. And I thought, well, a great way of getting a flavor of the time in would be to have him be like a fan of old time radio suspense radio. And uh, the first, I make a habit of visiting the graves of these fellows. As I go around the country, I think I've visited over half of their graves uh, by now, and I've got, you know, 20 more to go. But I'm walking around this graveyard just outside of Milwaukee, looking for a gravestone. 
just up one side, down the other. I know what a military marker is supposed to look like. So then I learned to you know, focus to see if there's a red flag or not. And I found Philip Johnson and just looking down at the dates, because you, you just, you know the name, um, you've read it many times, you know the date that he was born and the date he died, but to look down there and see that he was just 19 years old and he died on this island thousands of miles away from home, I just started to cry. I broke down. Mm. I felt so foolish, but I just couldn't it just choked me up so much to see his gravestone, this, this name that I had been researching and building a character around. Um, it just, uh, it really floored me at that time. Later on, I found out that Al Yunker uh, and Philip Johnson were buddies and they had made a pact. And it's funny because I wrote about the pact before I knew they made it. I thought, well, these two guys are from Wisconsin. Johnson's going to die there. It's very often they make pacts amongst themselves where if one of them dies, the other one's going to go and visit the other guy's parents. Mm -hmm. So it was written into the book before I learned that they actually had made a pact mm -hmm. that one of them would go home. And that was Al Yunker to visit uh, Philip Johnson's parents. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Al Yunker Jr. said that when his dad knocked on the door and the door opened, the face who was looking at him was Philip Johnson. His dad was a dead ringer for his son. Hmm. And that just, it knocked Al Yunker for a loop. Mm -hmm. And when Al went in, uh, Mrs. Johnson kept on asking him, well, how did my son die? You know, how did, how, how did Philip die? And Al just had to keep on skirting around it. You know, because you, you don't want to know how your, your son died quickly was, you know, all that he could say mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, nobly or whatever, whatever type of bone you can throw out there. You don't want to let her know how, what a grisly episode it, it truly was. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me, so you mentioned sort of the idea of creating a few elements for the purpose of the book. Um, so so that so I guess the question is obviously this is a true story like what's the purpose and how much would you put in fiction not fictional but stuff that sort of you came up with to try to explain something how do you approach that well the only the only sort of personality that we had to create was around Philip Johnson mm -hmm. and and really it's him only saying a few old time radio things. Uh, one guy said some, somebody said something funny, you know, at night uh, when lights went out, you know, it's later than you think. Mm -hmm. And they all thought that was funny. Mm -hmm. So we gave that to Philip Johnson and that happens to be an old time radio quote. And that's sort of what got me started about creating this character of Philip Johnson. Mm -hmm. But, you know, otherwise everything that happened happened you know, when they're walking into the Box Canyon where the um, ambush took place, you know, uh, from what Smot said, there was a sheer canyon wall on the left and uh, on the right, it, uh, it was fell off into a deep gully full of trees, you know, vines, trees and vines. Mm -hmm. So you had to color that picture a little bit more. You know, mm -hmm. the walls of the cave were mottled um with you know foliage and brambles and uh, uh crags uh and the the uh, road fell off into a gully full of trees choked with kudzu vines and you don't know how long i took trying to find out the specific type of vine that it could possibly be on the island of saipan in 1940. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> you know so a lot of it was you know really taking a, lo uh, a lot of time to get the right words and the right descriptions because what Saipan looks like today was vastly different what it, than it was then because the island was pretty much blown to hell mm -hmm. um, and destroyed. So, and a lot of vegetation that is there today 
wasn't there in the 1940s. So I'd have to go back and look through old recounts and old writings about what the flora and fauna of Saipan might have been like. And if I couldn't find what it exactly was, then I'd have to take a different bent on how can I describe what, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the, the red morning sky, you know, the red morning sky backlit the jagged peaks of the twin peaks of Tipo Pale and Mount Tapachu and the uh, spiny hills that formed the jagged backbone of Saipan. Mm -hmm. You know, it's painting the picture like that as opposed to the sun rose yeah. <laughs> and the yeah. island was silhouetted. You know, you have to then, a lot of what I did was to do, to accomplish this and driving from Wisconsin to West Virginia, to Georgia, to Arizona, to Montana, I'd spend a lot of time in the car because these were places that you can't really fly to. Mm -hmm. So I'd listen to a lot of old time radio and hear not only how people spoke back in the 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. so you could craft a dialogue that might be somewhat unique to that time period without being too um, slang, like odd slang, like calling a cigarette a nail, mm -hmm. um, to, to be able to write it so people today can understand it, but still that it has a flavor of that time period. Mm -hmm. And then also how you paint a picture with words. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Knuppel also gave me a VHS tape of the Battle of Saipan that was done by Marine Corps, um, what do you call them, videographers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would watch that and sort of describe what I'm, I would speak into a microphone mm -hmm. to describe what I am seeing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, uh, a coconut tree shattered to the roots, you know, foliage peppered with bullets, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. So that I could use that when it came down to a specific scene and I would have like pages of sentences or phrases for different aspects of like combat mm -hmm. or, you know, descriptions of scenery or language. Mm -hmm. And I would just go back and forth to things and piecing them all together, which is also one thing that made Cynthia, my co-author, such a blessing was I was so involved in that that she could take a broader look at it and deal with the actual flow of the action and how we could piece all of these stories together into the flow of the work. Mm -hmm. That's not sounding too. No, I'd follow. Okay. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah. So apart from uh, just giving this people, readers, this history, what, what do you hope the book will do for them? It really means a lot to the families of the fellows who served in this platoon, even fellows that aren't mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I let, because they're not known of in the group, mm -hmm. uh, they weren't spoken of because there were different squads and you pretty much hung out together and you might know a little bit of somebody else, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. But this is what their dad, this is what they never spoke about. And now they know. Mm -hmm. And so many of them are so thankful uh, Jesus Orozco's son, Andrew, Al Yunker Jr., Lonnie Jackson Jr., um, Steve Evans, Don Evans' nephew, uh, Chris Tipton, Hobart Tipton's son. All of these people are so grateful. And, and specifically, we didn't want to end it on you know, the end of the battle and guys died. I wanted to provide a little bit of historical fact about what happened to them after the war mm -hmm. and what damaged goods these guys were when they came home. Some of them were that way for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Some of them were able to get through it and cobble together a decent existence. Mm -hmm. Two of them drank themselves to death. Two of them that I know of 
drank themselves to death by the time they were 40. Hmm. And that for as noble of a cause and effective job that they did, how much damage it meant it did to their souls. In fact, one of them, I think it was my dad who said, um, you know, the loss of an arm or a leg you can learn to live with, but the loss of your soul is something you may never recover. You won't know until the day you meet your maker. Mm. Wow, yeah. Um, and uh, just to, to let people know that and that was the whole point of building up their characters beforehand so that you would fall in love with them as a brother, as a son, as a, um, a husband or a, a boyfriend, so that when they were killed on Saipan, it would be more impactful than just, you know, so in, uh, the cold way that they're announced in, you know, statistics. And I wanted the 3,000 casualties to have names. Yeah. Um, did he have any difficulties getting the book published? Not once uh, Cynthia and I, when, not once Cynthia came on board. Uh, prior to that, every time I'd uh, submit, they'd all be interested in the concept of it. And then when I'd submit the uh, unedited oral history version, it was yeah. goodbye, Charlie. Yeah. And when Cynthia and I crafted it into its current state, uh, we had two agents fighting over us. Then uh, we chose the one who could get it done the most quickly. And then she and then our agent had two publishing houses fighting over us. Uh, and we took the one that uh, offered the highest royalties because uh, my dad always said that we don't do enough for our veterans. And one of the things that I wanted to do with this book was donate half the royalties to organizations that help our veterans. Mm -hmm. So the bigger royalty, the more the veterans get. Mm -hmm. um, I just think I'd be a sad excuse of a son if I didn't honor his sentiment and, and not have what these men live through I wanted to make sure that their comrades and the generations after them, uh, the money is going to the organizations that really can provide them with help. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, current writing projects you're working on? It's actually been so uh, otherwise occupied promoting the book because every time I think there's gonna be a little lull in activity, there are things that pop up that, that you have to be prepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm uh, going to sequester myself in Salem, Oregon for three weeks and uh, work on one project that would be a companion piece for um, 40 Thieves. And then there are two other projects that I have to put in a better format before I approach Cynthia to see if she has interest in, in uh, crafting them. Another would be a World War II story sort of pre-European involvement that was a, something that someone sent me years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, another would be a story about Tarawa because just once again, through the book, a gentleman in Texas contacted me who is also a Marine, whose grandfather was in my dad's platoon on Tarawa. Mm -hmm. okay. And he saw the name on the book and sent me a picture of my dad with his Tarawa platoon and said, is this your dad in the center? That's my grandfather right behind him. Hmm. So I've been in contact with him and I wanna look over what he's sent and to see if there is enough information where we could do a decent job of it for Tarawa. Mm -hmm. um, because all of my sources are, are gone for that at this point. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't, uh, take note of it beforehand, then I'm kind of out of luck now because they're not around anymore. Yeah. Um, is there anywhere people can find you online, uh, social media or anything, website? Sure, we have a Facebook page. I have Instagram posts. Mm -hmm. Those are done quite frequently. Um, we have a website, 
where they can follow all of the press that we've uh, had. It's uh, 40thievesaipan.com. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what else? LinkedIn. There, but LinkedIn is, is something that isn't as prevalent as the first three. So is that is that 40 spelled out or the number 40? 40. 40. 40thievesaipan.com? Yeah, correct. Okay. All right. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? No, it's been a pleasure today talking to you. A lot of my more challenging interviews they have to be done in three minutes or two yeah. minutes. So it's really nice to have, to have the time to talk it through um, mm -hmm. because there is no short answer to any any question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the eulogy, when I say the eulogy at my father's funeral, that takes about 10 minutes if you want to hear the unabridged version of it. Yeah. <laughs> of yeah. what was actually said. Oh. But uh, no, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for talking to me today. Oh yeah, and thank you for taking the time to discuss this very interesting, fascinating story or s set of events. Yeah, thank you. All right. In the next episode, I speak with Tim Brady about Three Ordinary Girls, a history of three Dutch teenagers who engaged in espionage and assassination in World War II Netherlands. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Thank you for watching this video version of Military History Inside Out. If you like the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you're looking for military history and general history including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, Check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyandspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Thank you for watching.